morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Today. The first day of uh, four uh, days of hospital hearings. And uh, to begin things, I'm going to turn things over to Pat to give us a little uh, recap. Thank you, Kevin. For the record, my name is Pat Jones. I'm Director of Health System Finances at the Do Not Care Board. I wanted to start by just uh, showing a brief agenda for the day. Um, so uh, we will first of all go through a quick timeline of what the budget process looks like. And then we'll hear from four hospitals today. Gifford Medical Center, Copley Hospital, North Country Hospital, and Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. In terms of the timeline, um, we received budget submissions from each hospital on or around July 2nd of this year. From July and continuing into August, uh, the hospital budget team do, has done a detailed staff review of each budget. And I want to just take a minute here to thank the um, incredible health, health system finance team, Lori Perry, Kelly Thoreau, Tom Crompton, um, Janine Morrison, who many of you know, and is transitioning, Harriet Johnson has been a big help to us this year as well, and many others, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge them July 30th, we um, completed our initial staff analysis and sent questions to each hospital. We received responses from the hospitals on, on or by August 10th. Here we are at the hearings this week, uh, the 20th and the 22nd. We're in Montpelier and Burlington. Next week on the 27th and 29th, we're in Castleton and then back again in Montpelier. Public comment. We've been receiving public comment um, all along. The deadline for public comment um, on hospital budgets will be September 10th. The board uh, has discussion and makes decisions on hospital budgets at public meetings, essentially starting as early as October, uh, as August 30th, and going through September 14th. The board will issue decisions on each hospital's net patient revenue and rate by September 14th, and then by September 28th, uh, we'll provide written orders to the hospitals. So that's the timeline that we're looking at. This slide shows um, a couple of resources, and this uh, very brief deck will be on our website um, with links to the budget hearing schedule. Uh, to hospital budget information for each hospital, and then also a link to provide public comment. I'll, I'll close this part by just briefly discussing the role of the board. The approach of the board is to, um, first of all, establish net patient revenue for each hospital. And that includes an <coughs> aggregate level of net patient revenue for, for fiscal year 19 and also a rate of growth. The board also uh, approves changes in rates that are charged to payers for fiscal year 19. What the board doesn't do is set individual salaries, wages, um, or charges or prices for individual healthcare services. That's the role of the leadership at each hospital, including their board of directors and their uh, administrative staff. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Susan um, for some brief comments. Yes, thank you, Pat. I uh, just wanted to uh, brief the board on public comments and also to the public to reiterate uh, that our open public comment period for the hospital budget is uh, active until September 10th. You can do that on our website. You can send the comments in the mail. You can call Christina with your comments. Um, to date, we have received over 300 public comments, the majority of which have been related to the UVMMC nurses contract. And again, there will be a um, special public comment uh, uh, button on our website, and that to date, all of the public comments have been shared with the board. 
So I'll turn it over to Chair Mullen at this time. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, the hospital budget team. Um, they have been uh, working incredible hours in the, the little conference room uh, at our uh, offices. In fact, I <coughs> thought that it was her office. As one, one day I saw her going in there and her own office and uh, realizing that uh, she was in the wrong place. Um, before we get started, I do want to uh, state publicly that um, the board has reviewed the well over 300 public comments. We've also um, fielded some calls from legislators and others asking about uh, what will transpire on Wednesday. What will transpire is business as usual for the Green Mountain Care Board. The hearing will proceed as usual. Um, as Pat said, um, hospitals have the ability to um, manage to different events, and in fact, they do that regularly. Um, the hearing is not the final say. We'll make a decision in mid-September. A written decision must be issued by October 1st, and it will be. And um, every hospital has days cash on hand. They have the ability to make other changes to um, their operations as they see fit during the year. Hospitals also have the ability to come back to us um, mid-year if there is a problem um, with their uh, budget. Uh, and so uh, there is no reason why this board should not stay the course and proceed with business as usual. Uh, we expect on Wednesday uh, that it will be a little bit awkward going in as I understand there's gonna be a lot of people um, picketing out front, but that's okay. We, we're used to that. We've gone through public uh, comment periods after uh, QHP filings where we have to walk through uh, a number of people to go into uh, a hearing. So again, um, hospitals do have the ability to manage their own budgets. We're looking at um, a larger picture and uh, we wish both sides good luck. We want to have um, the best possible workforce healthcare in the state of Vermont, but we also want to keep um, healthcare costs under control, and several emails have really targeted the fact that um, they want it all, and unfortunately, uh, we're trying to create the all, but within reason. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan and the Gifford team so that we can proceed with today. So Dan, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you very much, and uh, I just want to echo uh, the comments before in uh, thanking uh, the staff at the Green Mountain oh, Care Board. As usual, I forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could ask the court reporter to swear in all people who are going to uh, testify today. Would you all please raise your right hands, please? Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? So with that, uh, again, I want to uh, echo uh, the previous comments and thanking the uh, staff of the Green Mountain Care Board and the Green Mountain Care Board for the back and forth interaction throughout this process. This is a lot of work that uh, you uh, go through. It's also uh, a lot of work and a lot of effort that we put into that, and there is uh, good uh, discourse back and forth, and we appreciate the ability to get clarification and share information as we go through that process. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we are here today to present the, uh, the budget for Gifford Medical Center. Um, uh, this is the agenda that we're going to uh, follow. Uh, this was uh, the agenda that was provided by the Green Mountain Care Board, so we are following that. I won't go into great detail on, uh, great detail on that. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce our team uh, today. My name is Dan Bennett. I'm the President and CEO at, uh, for Gifford Healthcare and Gifford Medical Center. Uh, to my right is uh, Ashley Lincoln. She is our Director of Development and Public Relations. Uh, to my left is Rebecca O'Berry. She is our Vice President of Operations. And uh, to the far right uh, is Jeff Hebert. He is our Chief Financial Officer. And uh, uh, behind me, because we only have room for four up here, is uh, Katrina Lumbright, and she is our uh, Controller. So um, I'll just briefly go over some general information about uh, Gifford. Um, 
we are here today to present the budget and accompanying information for Gifford Medical Center. Gifford Medical Center is a subsidiary corporation of Gifford Healthcare, which is our parent organization. Uh, we also have a, a third organization in our structure, which is Gifford Retirement Community. Um, our parent corporation is Gifford Healthcare. It is a federally qualified health center. Uh, this presents a very unique structure uh, for Gifford. Uh, you'll also see the same structure when uh, Springfield comes to present their budget. Um, but we are one of only a handful of organizations uh, in the United States that have the structure where a federally qualified health center is the parent organization uh, for a hospital, and in this case, also for a retirement community. This is uh, an organizational structure that we've had in place since 2014 when we did create the, uh, the FQHC. Uh, within the FQHC are our primary care practices, um, which are located uh, down at the bottom of the slide. Um, and then uh, within uh, the hospital uh, is our 25 bed critical access hospital, uh, where we provide uh, community-based uh, medical services uh, as well. And we have six locations, which are also uh, listed here. And then finally, we do have a retirement community uh, where we have a 30 bed uh, nursing home, a 49 apartment uh, independent living, and we have two adult day programs as well, one located in Barry and one in Bethel. Um, uh, for today, the budget that we're presenting and the information we're presenting is uh, for Gifford Medical Center. Uh, we will talk about some initiatives that we have underway that incorporate some of our other, uh, the other organizations and other programs within our corporate structure, but the budget presentation is uh, for Gifford Medical Center. We are also uh, located, uh, we're located centrally uh, out of uh, Randolph in Orange County, but we do have uh, locations throughout the Upper Valley and also into the capital area here in Vermont, uh, which this map um, uh, will show you. So we do have a uh, broader geographical reach uh, beyond uh, just uh, Orange County and the Randolph, uh, the greater Randolph area. Getting into some of the issues that uh, we are facing, and I think these are probably similar issues that you'll hear uh, with other hospitals when they come to make their budget presentation as well. Uh, workforce is uh, a big issue uh, for us, uh, both in terms of uh, turnover that we've had in, uh, in recent times uh, in our, surgical, or in our uh, physician services, general surgery, orthopedics, and primary care are areas where we have had uh, vacancies over the past few years. Uh, and in the last two years in particular, this has impacted our uh, volumes uh, that we've been able, uh, volumes of services we've been able to provide uh, at Gifford Medical Center and also uh, our revenue, which um, you have seen in our, um, in our financial information that we've provided. We also, uh, because of that, have had to rely on um, uh, temporary staffing, either visiting nurses uh, or locum physicians, so temporary staffing in those areas. Uh, in this particular uh, budget period, uh, in the year that we're in currently, general surgery and primary care are two areas that have been impacted by that. This does impact our costs, uh, although Gifford has uh, done a what I think is uh, an excellent job in uh, our cost reduction strategies over the last couple of years uh, that has been mitigated to some extent by additional costs that we've had to incur for temporary staffing. Uh, we also, like everybody else, uh, in healthcare and outside of healthcare, are dealing with a very tight labor market. Uh, unemployment is low and uh, it is uh, difficult to find uh, qualified staff for uh, many of our uh, physicians. Uh, some of the areas that, uh, some of the issues that we face within that are the difficulties in uh, recruiting to rural areas in addition to uh, a, a, a tight labor market. Uh, for us, that often um, involves when we're able to recruit somebody, uh, having opportunities for the spouse uh, or uh, uh, their, their loved one who comes with them. Uh, and also, uh, for us, the strategy that we have uh, taken is we do try to find uh, people who have some connection either to our local area, to Vermont, or to the activities that uh, our area provides, whether it's skiing, mountain biking, the arts, um, or somebody who just likes uh, long, cold winters. Uh, <laughs> are, uh, things that we, we uh, 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 strategies that we employ to uh, try to attract people to our area. 
differed this year in our physician practices, both our primary care and our specialty practices. We implemented a new electronic health record, ECW is the software. Uh, we went live uh, with that new electronic record in April. Um, however, leading up to that, uh, we had uh, a period where we were doing a lot of training, obviously, for, um, for both our uh, providers as well as the staff who work in our practices. Uh, and then uh, once people go live with that, there is a ramp up period for people to um, get used to using the software and for us to get all of our interfaces and other um, back office functions uh, uh, working properly. And that has had an impact on our volumes for the uh, past couple months, uh, the April, May, June time period. Uh, we are, like everybody else uh, in hospitals and uh, other uh, healthcare entities in uh, Vermont, um, uh, uh, assessing and uh, preparing in some cases for some of the hospitals uh, participating in healthcare reform through the Alpair model. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, further on in the presentation, but that is uh, an uh, initiative that uh, we have been uh, working on um, uh, at Gifford as well. And of course, uh, access to services is, uh, is an ongoing issue. Um, we are um, uh, focusing on the increasing needs for mental health and substance use services, and also for primary care services uh, in our area. So um, the risks uh, on this uh, slide are similar to the things that I just talked about. Um, under the first one, the ability to enter a risk-based reimbursement arrangement, arrangements. We are, as I noted, uh, currently evaluating our participation in the Alpair model for 2019. Um, a couple of the things that are um, Concerning to us as we uh, look at that, our, our, our ability as a small healthcare organization to maintain uh, our cash reserves and adequate uh, cash reserves to uh, insure us against uh, down um, financial years uh, and also to be able to take on the financial risk uh, inherent with, uh, with this model. Um, and as we've experienced over the past uh, couple of years, our small size uh, can result in greater volatility uh, when we have um, staffing shortages uh, or uh, vacancies in provider positions. So those are factors that uh, are weighing on us as we, um, as we evaluate our ability to participate in 2019. Um, I'll switch over to opportunities as I've already talked about the other two bullet points. Um, one, of the, um, one of the great benefits that we have at, uh, at Gifford is that connection between primary care and our hospital-based services. We are a federally qualified health center. Um, our primary care, therefore, uh, uh, in light of our structure, but also in our focus, uh, we put primary care uh, at the forefront of what we do. And uh, we have an opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, with the uh, FQHC structure to be able to provide integrated uh, care, uh, integrating uh, mental health services, substance use services, dental services, with our traditional uh, medical services as well. So we are well, well positioned there to uh, function um, uh, as we should uh, in caring for the health of our populations. Um, now Gifford has, over the last uh, couple of years, embarked on um, uh, what I think is a pretty aggressive and successful effort to uh, reduce costs via, and be more efficient. This is something that Gifford's uh, done for years, but. Um, we've done it with renewed focus over the last uh, couple of years, and we have had success in reducing our costs. Um, as I noted before, that has been offset in some areas by some of the um, temporary pressures that we've seen uh, in bringing in temporary staffing. We do have some promising new hires. Um, one of our focuses uh, is on uh, getting our uh, staffing back up to levels, uh, traditional levels, and being able to provide all the services that are needed in our community. Um, we do have two new trauma surgeons that started last week, um, and they are uh, already going strong. Uh, we have four new primary care providers who will be starting uh, between the 1st of September and the 1st of November, and we've had success in uh, filling some vacant positions in our uh, operating room, which uh, we have had to uh, utilize traveling staff for over the past um, over the past year, so we've had some success there as well. 
Um, and then um, later on in the presentation, uh, Ashley's going to talk about our expanded community health uh, and outreach programs, uh, which I think have been uh, a great success for us uh, over uh, the past year plus. So uh, she'll talk more about that as we uh, move on. One of the areas uh, we were asked uh, to um, comment on was the uh, access to care, the wait times uh, to get into services at Gifford. Um, within our practices, we do offer same-day appointments uh, for urgent or acute uh, patient visits. Um, and each of our specialties does offer a provider on call uh, for their uh, patient base so that we are able to answer uh, patient needs uh, as they arise. Um, another uh, commonly followed um, uh, statistic is the uh, time to the next, the third next available appointment. Uh, that does vary by clinical specialty, but um, we are able, uh, in general, to be able to see patients within five days. And we did note also that with our outpatient rehab, um, so PTOT speech, we are able to schedule new patient evaluations within five days and follow-ups within 14 days as well. So with that, going to turn it over to Rebecca O'Berry for the next part. Good morning. I wanted to talk about quality at Gifford Healthcare. Um, the slide in front of you is actually the all-payer model quality measures. And Gifford is feeling well poised to respond to this um, because we have been measuring quality. I should have asked you which button is supposed to go. Um, we've been measuring quality for years in a different sort of manner. Um, so this is a, two, a slide that shows our hospital and benefit, our hospital division and our surgical division quality measures. So each one of our divisions actually comes up with their own set of measures depending on you know, sort of what we're looking to improve and what's important to our patient base and our physicians. Uh, this, is the, um, this actually shows the other two divisions operations and then the primary care division. So as you can see, a lot of the things that we're measuring are also on the all-payer all -payer model, quality measures as well. The way we present our data to our quality committee and also up to our board is you know, through, these, through these types of um, slides that show the calendar quarter that we're reporting on and any of the measurements that we're reporting on. We have the indicators on the right-hand side as well as the comments to let the folks in our audience understand what we're measuring and what we're measuring against. So these are just a couple of examples to show you what we're doing. This slide is showing uh, another way that we're looking at it as a, a, a graph form over time. And what we wanted to talk about was hypertension here. Um, you can see in the bottom left corner that we've been measuring our hypertension for the last few years. And we've noticed you know, that we're kind of going up and down with our measurement. And so this year, we're actually putting a lot of effort into getting this onto our blueprint um, panel management to be able to spend a little more attention um, with this measurement. We actually have some education provided uh, that's coming up in our CME over the course of this year with two of our primary care providers presenting the, um, the best practices and getting everybody on board to be able to respond to this measurement. Um, as requested that um, we supplied in the presentation a profit and loss statement uh, that we um, actually got from the adaptive planning program. Um, we also did a balance sheet and a cash flow statement. Looking at the cash flow statement, I just wanted to point out that uh, we did have in 2017 an audit uh, um, adjustment uh, restatement of our financials, which is showing up in our 2019 budget under other changes and under other uh, long-term assets. So just to make you aware that that happened. But moving down to the ending cash, um, we ended out the 2017 actuals with uh, cash flows of uh, 3.3 million. Um, we did have a budgeted uh, cash flow um, for 2018 of 5.4. And as Dan alluded to, this year due to uh, staffing issues um, as well as productivity issues, um, we have Paired that back uh, in our budget 2019 to 2.7 million. 
It was requested to uh, um, have an understanding of uh, um, overall our outpatient procurement. Uh, um, um, for Gifford Medical Center, it's uh, um, when we take a look at the um, overall pair mix, uh, 3% represents outpatient pair mix. Um, when we out of state, um, out of state pair mix. And that uh, um, basically breaking it down, we have Blue Cross at 17, commercial at 34, um, Medicaid at 3, Medicare at 42. So we're having a we're due for our um, hospital survey from CMS. So they just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's the uh, um, operating department, all the ancillaries that are associated with that operating uh, um, slowdown. And then when we get into the clinics, the, uh, um, it, uh, uh, again, common theme was the OR, but also our EMR. You know, uh, we did start to uh, get ready. Uh, we had to, you know, basically make sure we had the appropriate uh, um, time to do the training, which um, has lacks of productivity uh, when that happens, as well as getting onto the new system. Moving down into the expenses, looking at the salaries and wages, um, we've been um, really focusing on making sure that we're using the right productivity mix, given the uh, um, revenue shortfalls, um, using uh, tools like Low Census, and whenever possible, um, looking at attrition for employees that uh, um, you know leave the organization. Our benefits um, overall are in line with our 2018 actual expectations, and we brought those forward in our 2019 budget. When we took a look at the um, advertising, um, that was one of the areas that we started to look at any and all expenses. Um, one of the uh, um, recommendations was to look at the uh, paper reports um, and you know take a uh, um, close look and um, understand what was needed. So, in regards to this year, um, our annual report, which is you know um, very expensive, uh, um, you know proposition, we decided to go electronic with that. We also looked at um, print ads and reducing those. And we uh, um, have held on an intranet site um, rework, uh, and we brought that forward in the 2019 budget. Depreciation. Depreciation is lower, um, but that is not a reflection of our cost-cutting uh, um, efforts. It's actually a reflection of IT. Um, you know, when we went into it 2018, we thought that the, our EMR was going to be a server-based application. After working with the vendor, they recommended that we go cloud-based. And so what you'll see further on down below is those, are, uh, um, those expenses actually live in our purchase services. Other, um, other basically, again, gets back to our cost savings initiatives. Um, you know, the areas that uh, we were able to really uh, look at was our dues, our freight, and our postage, and we're able to reduce those expenses. Um, we have uh, um, on this list as well as our network printer and copies. Right now we're working with our vendor to look at revamping the whole fleet. Um, you know, just like, uh, you know, it seems like with uh, um, different areas, there's always this creep that happens. Everybody likes to have a copier next to them. 
And so when we look at it, we have a lot of copiers within our organization. So we're pairing that back. We're making sure that we're right-sizing that copier fleet for our organization. The other thing that we're doing is we're saying, hey, do we need color? Um, you know, um, basically very simple, but you know, going through, making sure that everybody has the appropriate copying capabilities that they need. Purchase service, as Dan was saying, this is uh, um, up substantially, um, primarily due to uh, um, the use of locums, as well as the uh, um, use of traveling uh, um, nurses. Um, the other thing that uh, um, is in there is we did have um, an orthopedist contract which went into play as of October 1st. In our 2018 budget, that orthopedist was actually um, you know, in our salary budgets, but we did uh, contract that service for this fiscal year. And the other uh, um, initiatives was the uh, um, move to cloud-based IT. That's also up. So depreciation was down. Other purchase services was up due to the uh, IT services. And then utilize our utilities. Um, one of the things that we have been um, doing in the last few years is working with Efficiency of Vermont, and they've been very uh, helpful in us um, you know, looking at any and all costs and saving them. So this is our third year of completing our community health care needs assessment. This is mandated by the federal government. And our goal this year was to try to reach more people. We did indeed use a survey online. We used SurveyMonkey. And our responses came in at 392. Interestingly, this year compared to last, more of our responses were um, folks that had commercial insurance. But you will see that the responses still are in line. So what we're seeing year after year um, is for a healthy community, much as what Dan spoke to, we need to have good jobs. Folks, uh, we often talk about our ability at Gifford to be able to hire the first job, but finding the second job is often difficult. And a lot of our providers, our clinicians, um, our managerial staff, they need to go somewhere else for their spouse to have a partner. So we often lose those excellent candidates to the Burlington area, the Hanover area, because we can't provide that second job. But folks also want to have good schools and access to health care. Of course, at Gifford, access is not an issue. As Dan pointed out early on, we are spread all through the White River Valley from uh, Montpelier down to White River and over the mountain. Gifford, years and years ago, found out that the problem with healthcare is that folks couldn't get to it because of mountains. So we opened up clinics in Chelsea and Rochester. We brought primary care to the people. And of course, they do get their follow-up treatments at Gifford, but we have a nice partnership with Stagecoach, which is our local transportation. As far as health problems in our community, um, I have no doubt that the Green Mountain Care Board is going to hear these trends throughout their um, budget process with addiction, mental health issues, and obesity. You will see in a later slide that I'd really like to focus on, um, Gifford is doing an excellent job in responding to these issues that are being noted. Our areas of focus, um, as we have shared with our board and our entire management team at the hospital, we are going to continue working and looking at the drug addiction obesity, mental health is issues, and preventative health care. Folks also noted that sometimes they have a um, struggle in making an appointment during the day. Everybody's working. Um, and oftentimes they're working outside of Randolph. So right now we're looking at having those evening appointments. Because we know for working moms and dads, that's what's important. And folks also talk about not having dental insurance. Um, with our FQHC, um, this will be the next slide, we are able to uh, expand our dental health and our mental health services. Um, before I go to that, we'll stick to the obesity and preventative health. Gifford enjoys a very collaborative relationship with the Blueprint. We have our Blueprint team embedded in all of our primary care practices, and they are now on our main campus to work with patients that are in the emergency department. So when there are folks that are utilizing emergency department care as primary care, we know that's not the relationship we want to establish with that patient. 
we want to work diligently to make sure that patient is actually established with a primary care and created a relationship that's going to help manage these chronic conditions. Our blueprint team also has um, self-management programs. And again, much like primary care, we bring those self-management programs to the people in their communities. We go to the low-income housing in Chelsea. We go to the park house in Rochester because we know that transportation is always going to be an issue. So we bring the services to the people. We're thankful for our FQHC status and we have always partnered with Clara Martin as part of our community health team, but we ourselves are hiring folks to provide the substance use counseling, again, right within our clinics. And um, this year, we did get the MAT waiver increase, allowing our um, MAT providers to see up to 250 patients. And in September, the state has designated our Kingwood site for a Narcan distribution site. With mental health, as I mentioned with Clara Martin, um, Clara Martin has a clinic in our Chelsea uh, facility. So again, when folks access primary care in Chelsea, they can also access um, mental health uh, care as well. And at Gifford um, and in Berlin and White River, we also have these services. <laughs> but our community health initiatives, um, this is an area that I am very proud of. Two years ago, Gifford received a generous grant to really revamp and reinvigorate our community health programs. When we look back at that first slide and we talk about um, drug abuse, we talk about obesity, it's very hard to change the habits of an adult. We clearly have to be working with youth. Youth is where we're gonna be able to start changing mindsets, where we're gonna actually be able to, to teach them differently. Because when you are, your environment, if it is one that eats unhealthy, doesn't exercise, and you see your parents using um, illegal drugs, that's all you know. So if we can actually get to those students in a safe place at school, that's where we can make a change. And Gifford is committed to doing that. We installed a drug kiosk in January. We reached out to uh, other hospitals that have a drug kiosk and they said, oh, you'll probably change your bag three times a year. So good enough, we're, we're ready for that. We've changed it every three weeks. Gifford has actually taken over 600 pounds of medications off the streets since January. In addition, we received a $10,000 grant from the state of Vermont to again reach out to youth and do education about the importance of prevention around drugs. We called it our Dose of Reality series. It was a six weeks um, session at our Chandler, easy access, it was off site. We used all of our local talent within the hospital. And we brought in our pharmacist who talked about the effects of drugs from a pharmaceutical point. But she brought it down to a level that everybody could understand. And I will share with you that there was one woman who came, sat quietly in the back, every single session, never said a word until the last one, where she walked up to us and she said, thank you. She said, I lost my daughter. She overdosed on opioids. And she said, I always thought it was my fault. And now I know it wasn't. So that impact itself, we know that's where the difference is going to happen. And that's where we have to focus. In addition to all of our outreach, we are also partnering with our local law enforcement on a program called LEAD, which is Law Enforcement Against Drugs. And we have our local sheriff and deputies going into the school and working with fifth and sixth graders to teach them about the effects of alcohol and drugs. We have now been able to secure funding and they're gonna now go into the junior highs as well. Again, we're trying to get to the kids when they're young to try to break that cycle early on. In addition, we are now working with our local schools through an athletic trainer program. Um, it's mandatory for high school sports to have a athletic trainer on site. We're very happy that um, our, the schools are looking at Gifford to provide that service. So we're going in early and we're teaching kids about the importance of concussion safety, the importance of stretching, the importance of good um, uh, nutrition.
nutritional habits before they hit the fields. Again, trying to prepare them for a healthy season. Our skin cancer screenings. Last year we saw, um, I think it was with 10 clinics, um, we provided over 100 free full body skin checks. Um, we had people calling us saying, my goodness, will you do it again? We want to come in. So now that we have general surgeons on board, we're going to be kicking those off. Again, we're trying to do the early detection so it doesn't become the chronic problem down the road. And we're very pleased with the work that's being done at Gifford. Gifford is, uh, uh, has been doing a number of uh, investments uh, for health reform. Um, and uh, in the past, we have been a member of the CHAC ACO. Um, that uh, ACO uh, ceased operations at the end of 2017, so currently we are not participating uh, in one. Um, we will be, uh, we are um, uh, currently evaluating uh, participation with one care in the Alpair model. Um, uh, so there are no uh, expenses budgeted for 19 in, uh, in, in this budget at this point. Um, uh, for that. Uh, we did, as we noted before, we did implement a new electronic health record uh, this year, and uh, that uh, is a tool that we believe will help us uh, in our population health management uh, capabilities. Uh, we will be able to um, uh, receive data, understand data um, uh, more, uh, more quickly, uh, and also understand uh, the different needs of our patient population and then be more proactive in reaching out to our patient population with services, uh, with resources, with education and support uh, that they need so that we can help them, um, uh, whether they have a chronic disease or multiple chronic diseases, to live um, a more healthy life um, when they're dealing with those diseases, but also to work with uh, uh, people so that they don't develop chronic disease and can stay healthier throughout their lives. Uh, we also have a number of uh, quality management activities that we're engaged in, um, and many of them are tied together towards uh, working with people, either people who uh, utilize our emergency department at a high rate, um, uh, or people who come to our emergency department and don't have a primary care provider. Uh, we're working with those people through the Blueprint program, through our care coordination program, to help them become established with a primary care provider so they don't need to utilize the emergency department uh, for, um, for care that could be provided in a, um, uh, in a primary care and less expensive uh, setting. Um, we are working with the people who utilize the emergency department to a high degree. Um, again, with our uh, community health team, with the Blueprint program, uh, to help them to get um, to get linked up with other services that are in the community, whether it's uh, through us or whether it's through other uh, partner organizations. Uh, we are also uh, working with our partners in the community and with our primary care, uh, with people who uh, do have multiple chronic diseases, who are considered on a clinical risk scale to be high risk, um, so that um, they can um, have assistance in managing those diseases, uh, self-management, and being able to stay out of the emergency department, and stay out of um, uh, our, the inpatient setting uh, where possible. Uh, Gifford did start a post-acute uh, care clinic, which is a, uh, a clinic that is staffed by one of our physicians. Um, and our goal there is to see patients who have had an inpatient stay, or uh, in some cases, emergency department stay, within 48 to 72 hours after they're discharged. Some of the things that um, uh, we work on with patients in those visits is making sure that they understand their discharge instructions, make sure that they uh, are able to get appointments that they need uh, if they don't already have them before they're discharged with uh, their primary care provider, with other specialists that they need to see, uh, making sure that they understand uh, what prescriptions they have, that they were able to fill those prescriptions, uh, and that they understand um, how they're supposed to be uh, taking uh, their, their medications. Ultimately, the goal is to make sure that uh, people are not having to make return visits to the inpatient setting or the emergency uh, uh, department setting, and that they are established uh, with care in the right environment, uh, preferably primary care where we can. Um, and then uh, the second item under their panel management 
Um, it's important that we get people into primary care uh, and then that we work with them, um, again, if they have chronic diseases, if they have other uh, needs, uh, that we're able to help them um, to get the services and the resources they need, that we're working proactively, proactively with them to help them uh, manage their own health. So these are uh, some of the initiatives that uh, we are making uh, to ready ourselves for healthcare reform um, and to be able to serve our patients as well. Um, and this is, um, again, uh, from the community side, uh, a listing of the investments, some of the investments. Ashley just went through this list, so I won't, uh, I won't do it again, but uh, this is uh, definitely a part of our uh, investment uh, in healthcare reform in population health management. Back to Jeff. All right, looking at our capital. Um, for this year, our capital overall, both for building services as well as major movable, was just making sure that Gifford was, um, you know, uh, um, its capital needs were on um, either upgrades or replacements. Looking at the first project is a lighting upgrade. Again, um, you know, we communicated that we have been working really closely with Efficiency Vermont and uh, making sure that we're appropriately, uh, you know, setting the organization up for the future. So that's one of our big projects at 320,000. The other projects, for the most part, are either replacements or upgrades, fuel tanks, rooftop replacements. Uh, we have a gamma banner, which you will see in the major movable. It's a very big project, but that is replacing an old gamma, gamma camera security badges, interior, exterior camera upgrades, um, a burner replacement, again, working with Efficiency Vermont to make sure that uh, we're doing that appropriately, and refrigerator upgrades. Looking at our major movable, um, throughout uh, this list, you'll see that either it's, uh, we're replacing or we're upgrading current equipment. First is the camera. camera. Um, we have an endoscopic system. Hack system, mobile, um, EMR, all these are replacements. Um, BACO, pulmonary, and cardiac. And again, one being the BACO is an upgrade, the other two are replacements. So, one of the questions we were asked is to comment on our financial outlook and also. Um, link that back to the goals of the all-payer model. Um, as we have noted, and as you've seen in the information that we've provided, um, we are having a down year, uh, which, uh, as we've talked about, is uh, related to the vacancies we've had in provider uh, positions and also in some of our other positions um, and the impacts that's had on our volumes. Uh, moving forward uh, in our financial outlook, uh, we are in the process of uh, building back uh, our, um, uh, our, our vacancies, building back to historical levels with our uh, providers, uh, primary care, surgical services, uh, and also, as I noted earlier, we have had success in being able to add back permanent staff in some of those areas where we've been using temporary or travel staffing, which uh, does have uh, a, that does have a positive impact on our uh, costs. So uh, we are looking to get back to um, our fourth, uh, historical levels in terms of our volumes, but also to our historical performance, which has been steady for years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so we, um, in, in looking forward to um, how that aligns with the L payer model, we've talked about some of the investments we've made uh, over the past year and beyond in, uh, in focusing on primary care and focusing on preventive care and focusing on community health, uh, the integration that we have between our primary care, uh, mental health, substance use, dental, specialty care, hospital services, uh, all, of these, um, all of these activities um, and all of that which is uh, near and dear to what Gifford does, these activities, sorry, these activities um, are consistent with the goals of the Alpayer model uh, to be able to provide preventive uh, health care, to be proactive, uh, to be able to provide care in the lowest cost setting, to help uh, people in our community to uh, remain healthy uh, and to improve their health where that is needed. Uh, in addition, Gifford is also, uh, as we've noted, uh, had a, a strong focus on uh, cost reduction, efficiency, uh, reducing our costs where we can, 
um, and uh, also being as efficient as, as we can, utilizing resources like Efficiency Vermont to uh, reduce the cost of our utilities uh, throughout our organization. Uh, we also uh, believe that it's important and necessary that we collaborate with our local partners and also with our regional partners. Jeff, um, in going through uh, our, um, our cost uh, before, uh, noted about uh, orthopedic uh, surgery and moving the orthopedic surgeon from salary to contract. We did establish a contract with Dartmouth Hitchcock last year uh, to have orthopedic uh, coverage uh, in our community. That is something that we did in collaboration with them in looking at the, what the needs were for the area and making sure that we weren't duplicating services, but we were uh, collaborating and uh, utilizing an existing physician uh, who was already employed at Dartmouth Hitchcock to provide some services up in our area. Uh, so this is a, uh, an example of what, um, of our philosophy of uh, providing care in our community, but not duplicating not uh, bringing on uh, additional uh, cost to the system where um, we can avoid that. Um, so we feel confident uh, in our uh, ability to meet the goals of the health care model. Uh, we feel that what we're doing is consistent with that. Um, and uh, as I noted before, we are actively evaluating right now our participation for uh, 2019. Um, the, uh, the process uh, for getting all the information uh, that is necessary to make those decisions uh, does not really dovetail well with this process. Uh, we're still getting information uh, from One Care working uh, collabor collaboratively with them to get the information we need to make these final decisions, but that time frame is very compressed, so um, that is not included in our budget for this year, but uh, we will be deciding in the next uh, couple of weeks um, uh, what our direction uh, there will be and uh, we have had uh, numerous phone calls and uh, meetings with One Care. Um, we've had presentations to our board of directors uh, from One Care and also from um, other hospitals that are currently participating uh, in the all payer model to better understand it, uh, understand uh, how that's working, understand all the different uh, pieces of it, uh, and also understand uh, what investments and what uh, capabilities we need to have in place uh, in order to be successful in that. So um, we'll have, um, as I noted, uh, decisions on that within the next couple weeks. I believe the deadline for us to get back to them is uh, the 1st of September. So um, as all of us are starting to know, summer's almost over. So uh, we will make those decisions uh, very quickly. More questions? So one of the final requests was historic compliance with the budget orders. Um, looking at the um, net patient revenue, the green line will be the budget expectation, the black line is uh, the actual experience. Um, to start the presentation, we went over um, how Gifford is structured and we communicated that Gifford Healthcare was the parent and then underneath that was Gifford Medical Center and Gifford Retirement Community. Prior to 2014, it was just Gifford Medical Center and uh, the nursing home as well as the primary care um, clinics were actually departments of the hospital. Going into the 2014 budget, we did meet with the Green Mountain Care Board um, and asked, how would you like us to present this? We didn't know when the actual FQHC would get its a, approval. Um, we knew that it was going to be in 2014 at some time. At that time, the recommendation was that we would then budget the entire um, primary care as a full year, and then just explain when we came to uh, um, to this uh, group uh, um, what the differences were. So on July 1st, our Gifford Healthcare Primary Care FQHC um, came into existence, and that revenue then went to Gifford Healthcare instead of Gifford Medical Center. In 2015, um, the same situation um, occurred. We actually uh, finished construction on our nursing home. We were moving away from a hospital-based um, department of the uh, hospital nursing home and a standalone. So we had to uh, create a new corporation called Gipper Retirement Community. Again, we uh, seek the counsel of the Green Mountain Care Board to say, how do you want us to present this? Um, you know, going in, we knew at some time that this would happen. And in two, uh, I believe, around July or March, actually, the uh, nursing home came into existence. And so that was the reason for the reduction in net, net patient revenue. 
Also, when we take a look at uh, our compliance, we do look at our operating margin. Um, FY17, you know, um, you know, you're aware that uh, Gipper Medical Center did have a, a down year. Um, but prior to that, when we take a look, again, the uh, green budget, the black is uh, on the actual experience. Um, we feel that, uh, you know, we've been very tight to those expectations that we come forward to this group with. And with that, we'll turn it back to the board and now thereafter for follow-up questions. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we're going to open it up to the board and to our hospital budget team to ask any questions. Um, who would like to start? Robin, you look like you're itching. I'm happy to start or I'm happy to wait, either way. But if you want to go down the line, I'm happy to get us kicked off. Well, I think we'll go down the line and let Pat go last. Okay, great. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, first of all, before I jump into some questions, I wanted to uh, say I really appreciate uh, the expansion of the MAP program, <coughs> the Medicaid Assisted Treatment program that was highlighted in your budget materials. Uh, my notes and my recollection is that you tripled your capacity. I think that's terrific. Um, so you, I just wanted to give you a public kudos for that focus. Um, I did have a question around mental health. It looks like you're staffing on mental health, you had a vacancy. Um, so I wondered if you could talk just a little bit more about your recruitment plans and also how that interfaces with the telesite services with the retreat that you mentioned in your materials. So we have just recently hired a new counselor, a new psychotherapist, who is um, working in our main, on our main campus. Um, so that position is posted. We also have another position that we're looking to fill um, to actually embed, we're hoping to embed that person in our emergency department and also do some clinical hours. Um, we have, a, our site in Bethel had an, uh, an external uh, psychologist who was there who has recently vacated the premises and we are looking to put somebody, embed somebody in that practice as well. So that's how we're, that's how we're managing the outpatient services. Um, the telepsych, um, is going to be focused with our emergency department, um, and we're working with um, Red Road Retreat um, with, in, 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 you know, in collaboration with them to provide that service. So they're, they're distinctly different um, services that we're trying to have. The, the person that we're trying to embed in the emergency department is really to then direct the patient where they need to go. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I, in reviewing your blueprint practice profiles, one of the areas that stood out to me is that you're actually the highest in your HSA, you're the highest per capita cost uh, for the state. So I wanted to ask you when you are doing your community health needs assessment and you're looking at what services are needed in the community, how you consider uh, the fact that it looks like at least for price, uh, because quite frankly, for the resource utilization, you were right on average, but the price, you were an outlier uh, compared to other hospitals. So I was hoping you could speak to that in terms of how you determine what services are needed on the inpatient and outpatient setting, uh, and also how that we should think about that in relationship to your 4% commercial rate increase. So when, when we're looking at that, um, uh, we talked about the different investments we're making terms of uh, primary care and preventive health care. We think that is the area that we need to be focused on in order to drive down the cost of care uh, throughout our health service area. Um, we work very closely with our blueprint program, <coughs> our community health team, uh, and are establishing new ways of uh, reaching our patients, uh, people who are the high utilizers of services, uh, ensuring that uh, we are uh, getting people established in primary care. We think that is the, uh, that's really the pathway to be able to drive those costs down. Um, we have had, which we, we alluded to um, earlier, but we have had uh, since about 2015, 2016, we've had uh, some turnover in our primary care areas, which we think has impacted um, that, those statistics, those numbers. Um, we, as I noted uh, earlier, we have um, added back four, um, we have four new people coming in uh, in the next two, three months. Uh, 
uh, we think that is going to extend our <coughs> capabilities and our, uh, our, our access to services for primary care. And again, we think that is really the pathway um, to making an impact. We've also made uh, an investment in a new electronic health record. Um, our uh, former system uh, that we used in our practices did not provide us the capabilities to be able to track down to provider specific levels and patient specific levels. Uh, what the needs are um, for people for us to be more proactive, uh, but also to say, okay, do we have any outliers? Do we have areas where we're over ordering tests or whatnot? Um, our new data capabilities, and which we are just developing again, this um, system we just brought alive at the end of April. Um, uh, there are more capabilities within that system, and we are building capabilities within uh, our organization to be able to utilize that data to better understand uh, what's going on there and uh, be able to uh, impact that. Uh. Thank you. Um, on your commercial rate increase, uh, could you talk a little bit about your payer arrangements? Uh, obviously, when, when you have an increase to charges, that would impact your payer arrangements that are a percentage of charges. I'm assuming with Blue Cross, you're on their community fee schedule. So could you just talk a little bit about kind of the range of commercial contracts that you have and, and how that commercial rate that's approved as part of your budget flows through down to the net cost? So really for the, uh, the commercial rate increase, it's Blue Cross and it's MVP that, uh, that we have, you know, um, that we have an arrangement with. Um, in regards to the rate increase, we utilize this forum as a discussion with, uh, uh, with our payers, um, making sure that we are um, appropriately, you know, reinvesting within the organization, um, within our staff, within the organization, and, uh, um, and uh, we look to your guidance um, to communicate with them that uh, that is, you know, what, uh, um, you know, is the needed rate increase for a given medical center. Um, and so, you know, honestly, some of the conversations that we'll have when, uh, you know, they give us a holler and stuff and um, with the oversight and stuff. Okay, and I just have one last question. Um, I was also noticing in your Healthy Vermonters 2020 report that um, your coronary heart disease death per 100,000 rate is on the high side and I'm compared to the state average and also has increased uh, in the two periods of time that they measure. I wonder if you could speak to that statistic, and if you're not prepared to do that today, certainly uh, you can follow up later. I think we prefer to follow up. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for the tour a while back. It was a, um, you have a very nice hospital. Uh, it, just, it just felt like a nice place to be. So I, I just have a couple of questions. It, it looks like uh, 2019 is a very pivotal year for you folks. Um, and I'm, I'm just looking at some of the financials here. And, um, you're looking uh, to, and this is uh, 2019 budget over 2019, uh, as, as we're tracking, um, at a 4.9, almost $5 million increase in revenues in, in uh, 2019. Uh, $2.9 million or 5% cut in expenses so that you can change your bottom line from a negative $3.9 million to a positive $2.2 million, which is a $6 million shift. And that, that just seems like an extraordinary uh, task. Um, and the more extraordinary a task becomes, the higher the risk becomes. And so I'm looking at your revenue uh, uh, um, <coughs> uh, projections. And so you're looking at uh, Overall, a 9.88 percent increase in, in NPR, uh, the commercial rate, commercial increase, going up 9.6 percent. The Medicaid, 15.5 percent year over year, and Medicare at 9.9 percent. Um, and from your rate increase, I think if you're only predicting just from the pure rate increase, about a 1.6 million dollar increase in revenue. So. What, what worries you the most about not hitting these targets um, on, on your three different major uh, uh, payers, commercial, 
uh, Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicare. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just going to get to the more existential part of that, and if Jeff wants to jump into um, some of the um, specific uh, numbers. Um, one of the things that we talked about, we were here a few months ago on a, um, for a hearing on rebasing, and one of the things that we focused on during that, um, during that conversation was uh, building back to our historical levels in terms of our staffing uh, and volumes and whatnot. Um, we have had uh, what I would say a significant uh, turnover within our surgical services in the last uh, couple of years. Um, we have our, uh, getting uh, more stability on the uh, orthopedic side. Um, uh, and uh, as I noted, just last week we had, uh, we filled our two vacant uh, general surgery positions, which uh, we have been filling for the last several months uh, with uh, locum uh, temporary positions, which uh, is a higher cost, uh, and uh, you do not get the same level of uh, uh, volume uh, and uh, referrals through there. So we feel that uh, in those areas, we are going to get back to uh, meeting the need in our community, uh, getting back to our historical levels. Uh, primary care has been really the other uh, the other side um, that we've been uh, building back on. We had a number of retirements. Uh, we had uh, a number of people who left. Uh, we had a couple people who left for love. Uh, we had a couple people who left because of the opposite of love. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we have uh, had success uh, uh, over the past uh, couple of years in building back in those areas. Uh, we have a great um, team of uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs in our primary care side. Uh, and again, we are adding two physicians and uh, a nurse practitioner and a PA over the next uh, three months, um, getting us back to our historical levels. Again, we're not looking at shooting the moon here. We're looking at getting back to uh, historical levels, meeting the needs uh, that exist in our communities. Um, and we think, uh, you know, that uh, is going to be, uh, we, we don't think that that is uh, risky in terms of what we're predicting now that we have the people in place. Uh, you know, what any uh, hospital and healthcare provider of our size um, deals with in terms of uh, risk is that we have those, we have that turnover, we have that um, somebody uh, in, people in crucial uh, uh, provider positions leave um, we don't have uh, a team of uh, you know, 20 surgeons. If one leaves, they can just pick up the volume. We have, in a lot of cases uh, uh, in our practices, one or two people of a particular specialty. If one or two leave, that's a huge hit. So that's where the risk always lies. Um, but we think that, uh, you know, we feel confident that uh, in the people that we have and the people we have coming, um, uh, I personally feel great about the, caliber of uh, people who are coming, both in terms of their uh, clinical skills, but also, and I'd say almost as important, or maybe as important, is that these are people who want to be here. Uh, we talked about the type of recruitment you have to do for any staff. You need to get people who want to be in this location, in this environment, um, and who bring the right, um, uh, the right attitude, the right uh, convictions to what they do, and I, I, I feel strongly we have that. So what I, what I sense is that, and you can see from your trend lines that, that you have lost uh, in, in recent year or two uh, quite a bit of your historical volumes. Um, given that, where do you think that volume went while you were going through these staffing uh, concerns? Um, and what is your strategy to regain what you have lost in recent years, um, other than you know, actually providing the people that can provide the service? Um, so, uh, there's a number of places where it could have gone. I don't have the definitive data on, on that, but uh, definitely um, urgent care has been uh, something that I think people have uh, relied on more. Um, and then obviously uh, there are other uh, providers uh, within particular distances from us. Um, our strategies uh, for um, uh, winning people back, if you will, uh, Ashley talked a lot about the community health, community outreach initiatives that uh, we've uh, undertaken, expanded over the past couple of years. I feel strongly that uh, those are activities that benefit 
uh, the community, but they also, um, uh, I think, are a clear message to the community that we're here, we're here for them, we're doing the things that are in their best interest, um, and I think those are activities that will go a long way towards uh, helping um, uh, people want to come back to Gifford if they've had to seek services elsewhere. I also think that it's important that we be uh, flexible, and uh, the model that um, you know we have employed over the year, uh, over the years, or any other healthcare entities have employed over the years, might not be the model of healthcare that resonates with um, uh, with new generations or uh, generations that have been with us for years. And we have to be flexible in offering uh, uh, access, different access, different ways to access services types of services um, and uh, just uh, that those are things that we're looking at as well in terms of having expanded hours, expanded days, uh, when services are available. So uh, that's important. To Two more quick questions. Um, the, uh, I was, uh, saw in your presentation you, you mentioned that as many hospitals in Vermont seem to have uh, an issue with travelers and that you're trying to reduce that. But when I went to the utilization tab, um, it was you know, going back to 2015, it, it had a zero <coughs> travelers uh, kind of building into your staffing profile. So I'm just wondering if you can, you know, provide us with a, a history on the travelers um, that kind of tracks the money um, that you, what, what you've been expending in, in 2016 and 17 and, and where you hope to be in 2019. That seems to be a big item. And finally, uh, <coughs> you, in your materials that you wrote off about 2.69 million in uh, bad debt in, uh, in uh, prior to 2016, bad debt that have been, been accumulated up, up, up to then. Do you have any sense that uh, all of, I mean, because you have free care, do you have any sense that, that all of that bad debt is truly bad debt and, and uh, unpayable by folks and so there's no reason to can, can, if, if the strategy could be found uh, to continue chasing that debt. I started on the um, bad debt question. This is the last one. Uh, um, overall, our bad debt, uh, uh, we do closely monitor that bad debt. Uh, we have to um, because eventually, um, for our cost reports, we have to discharge the debt, meaning that it is truly, you know, 100% uncollectible. We utilize outside resources to do just that, and they then come back and say, okay, this one, you know, we're pretty much at, um, um, you know, we can't find any uh, um, other alternatives and stuff. And so then what we'll do is in the system, we'll actually indicate that an account's been discharged, uh, we report it on our cost report, and then that means that we cannot, at that point, uh, collect additional money on that, uh, that outstanding debt. So yes, I think we feel very confident that uh, um, when we get to that point, uh, we utilized all our resources. The travelers, um, one of the big things in the 2019 budget. Um, this year, definitely, we had locums and we had travelers. Uh, we had a lot more than we've ever experienced uh, in years past. Um, prior to 2016, you know, um, our traveler usage would be, you know, um, very insignificant and stuff. 2018, it definitely came on strong. Um, we're basically, um, I believe, you know, and I constantly, uh, you know, check in, Around August and September, we'll be seeing the last of the travelers, um, you know, um, the contracts being uh, um, non extended and going into the 2019 budget. We do not have that travel expense. Thank you. Yes, Good uh, first, I want to thank you guys for um, really adhering to the presentation and kind of putting in you know, all the charts that we asked for because that was really helpful. Um, I want to ask you about the audit adjustment that you had. The like you wrote off looks like 5.5 million is hitting in 2019 on your cash flow, and did that represent um, you know a material weakness or a significant deficiency through your audit? And does it have any impact in the future? No, it uh, um, it was a deferred compensation entry. It went in and went out, um, you know, on our balance sheet, um, and it doesn't you know the auditors were not concerned. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is really, you know, we, we focus a lot on NPR and on, you know, hitting the, the targets for NPR. And one of the things we talked about at the end of 2017 was rebasing. And part of the reason we looked at rebasing 
at not only the hospitals that were above but below was because of the financial risk that some of those hospitals have, specifically in the losses that, that are being generated. And you know, you guys kind of resisted, you know, that rebase and when, when we we didn't end up rebasing the hospitals down, but the concern is more that you guys potentially are setting yourselves up for the same thing in 2019. We, we had a very similar conversation last year when we looked at your budget and where you were gonna come in and um, that you were gonna get new, new docs and things were gonna get you up to the number that you had, had put into the budget. And now we're running about 15% behind your budget and a $6 million operating loss against a million something operating loss last year. So, you know, I appreciate your chart where you said you've pretty much been sticking with, you know, the operating losses up till last year. And so, I guess the question really is just how can you insulate yourself against future downside risk? Um, I think you're ending the year with, you're projecting in 2019 to have about 2.7 million on cash on the balance sheet. If you have another bad year, you could wipe that out. Um, you know, Tom pushed on that before about how you're going to get there, but I, I just, you know, really question, you know, yes, your NPR is down 6% to budget, but it's up 10% against the, where you're coming in this year. And so how much optimism in there, how much did your board push you to really, you know, prepare yourselves in case there is a loss, and how can we help you? Because, you know, I, I really think the concern for hospitals that are losing money and continuing to lose money you know, could put them at jeopardy in the future. Did you write one down? So, uh, I'll, um, a lot in that question, obviously. Uh, I'll, uh, I have um, uh, a couple of board members in the room, and they're not sworn in, so I want to ask them to swear. But uh, I can tell you that our board um, uh, is very close to, um, monitors very closely um, how we're doing. We have a very active board. We have a very involved board. Um, they share the same concerns that I do, that all of us do, that you do, uh, about our, our need to uh, improve our financial results. Um, and we also understand the, uh, the timing of uh, our time frame of, of, of how and when we need to do that. Um, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we have been rebuilding back our, our staff. Uh, and uh, I do feel confident in our ability to do that and the impact that that will have. But we also have been uh, uh, very, uh, you know, taking a very robust efforts to make sure that we get our costs down. And our costs are lower this year than they were last year. Um, and we expect that our costs next year will be lower than they are this year. Um, so it's not just a one-pronged uh, uh, effort to look at improvement, we're looking at uh, both sides of it, both the volume and uh, the expenses. Um, we are continuing to look at um, uh, the different services that we provide, uh, making sure that we're providing the right services that we're not overreaching, um, and uh, also um, getting more information on, uh, to help us make strategic decisions as we move forward. So um, we are, um, uh, you know, with, saying the same things that uh, Tom's question really, but um, you know, we feel confident in, um, in, in our ability uh, to do that. We also understand that uh, we need to continue to um, you know, be very diligent and um, uh, making sure that we get to the, where we need to in terms of our financial results. Um, what you can do to help us, uh, you know, I noted that we are going through our deliberations in um, uh, deciding where we uh, you know, what we do in terms of the all-payer model. We are very interested in uh, all the goals of that, of that initiative of health care reform. Uh, we are very, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're definitely uh, looking at being a part of that. Uh, what we ask you is for patience. Um, you know, we do need to make sure that we have the stability and the reserves in order for us to take on the financial risks in that. Um, that might need that mean that we take a different life path than uh, some others, um, and but that does not um, uh, you know, that that is not an indication that uh, we're not um, uh, that that we don't um, buy into the goals of that and uh, want to be a part of it. So uh, you know we uh, 
think uh, uh, Chair Mullen noted at the beginning that the hospital boards make these kind of decisions, and uh, ours will in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and uh, but we, you know, we, we ask for patience and understanding that uh, there is greater risk for smaller entities <coughs> as they go into this, and thank you for your support in uh, helping us to, to make those good decisions. Um, yeah, I did want to applaud you guys on your cost savings, and you know, I think you really have lined out a whole bunch of cost savings and looked at, you know, probably downsizing in some areas and cutting back staff where um, not everyone is doing the same thing. You know, other hospitals might be showing they're going to get an increase in keeping their expense levels up, but they may not get that increase in NPR and, you know, could put them at further risk. So, um, do you think there's risk in your budget? But, um, We'll see you next year, I guess, we're out things play out. Thanks. Okay, Jess. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I can share some of the concerns that have been aired already, so I won't repeat those um, about potential risks in your budget and you know, meeting the NPR targets that you're setting for yourself. But I do want to applaud you, actually, on a couple things. I think the access and you know, the fact that you can have patients you know, that are getting uh, seen within five days, I think that's fantastic. I think some of your Looking at the all payer model quality metrics, you're at the state average or even better and at the target levels <coughs> on, along most of those um, targets. The one that you didn't mention, um, which I'm hoping that you will move the needle on, is about the percentage of adolescents uh, on Medicaid getting well child visits. And so that's something I didn't hear anything about specifically a uh, strategy to target that, but I'm hoping that that's on your radar screen um, to improve upon. But in general, applaud you for, for the, you know, the quality metrics that we're seeing there and your attention to that. Um, and in, also, to echo Maureen, some of the cost savings that I, I see that you're doing are impressive. Um, one of the questions I have, and this actually relates to this uh, all-payer model and, the, and one care in particular, and I realize that you're currently evaluating that participation and you have concerns about reserves and the risk therein. Um, but one of the things, actually, this is a response to the HCA, uh, that when they asked you about moving Medicare payments to a capitated ACO, the response was, it would put at risk our ability to offer new community services and cost-based cost reimbursement offers a buffer and insurance care will be paced, paid based on actual costs. And I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit to that answer that you gave in the sense that other critical access hospitals under cost-based reimbursement are in the model uh, for Medicare, and so I'm wondering what is different about Gifford and your concerns about losing that buffer of cost-based reimbursement should you decide to join Medicare? I think part of that is, uh, uh, is a point in time. Uh, you look at our, um, uh, our performance the last two years, and um, uh, you know, the cost-based reimbursement was put in place by uh, the critical access uh, status and the cost-based reimbursement was put in place by CMS for the very type of situation that we have encountered in the last couple of years uh, with a small provider, uh, seemingly small changes in uh, personnel and providers can have a significant impact. The critical access status was meant to protect against that and it has helped to protect against that. So uh, really for our point in time, uh, it is important that uh, we have that as we're going through this improvement uh, process that we're going through. So uh, you know, again, when I talk about patients, when I talk about the glide path getting in, uh, into the Altair model, uh, when I talk about making the right decision, these are all things that we have to, to weigh um, uh, within those decisions. So um, you know, the, again, the critical access status was put in place for a particular uh, reason and uh, it's to uh, make sure that small rural uh, providers like us um, uh, can weather these kind of storms um, and have some security and uh, so that we can continue to meet the needs of our communities and uh, you know that is our concern and again um, uh, as we're able to build back and we're able to have the reserves um, that situation may change but uh, that is uh, a concern that we have at present is there any, I mean, so some of, um, you know, the advantages people argue about fixed payments is that it actually reduces uncertainty and reduces financial volatility if you, you know what you're going to expect from a fixed payment. Um, 
to advance. So how does that play into your concerns as a hospital about risk and volatility, um, you know, potentially getting involved in a fixed payment, value-based payment reimbursement system? Well, uh, so I think one of the, one of the real um, difficult things that we've been dealing with in terms of this decision of when and how to get into the all-payer model is the timing of information that, and the, the method of uh, receiving the information that we need to make those decisions. And I'm, I'm hearing my board members talk in my ear as I'm saying this, but um, there is a really tight, compressed time frame within which we can get the information that we need to use to make these decisions. Um, we are two weeks out from needing to make this decision. We still don't have, we have a, a phone call later on today uh, to get some more information and to better understand what we've been given. So I still don't have all the, uh, all the information I need to answer that question and to be able to understand uh, where there's greater risk, where there's less risk, uh, how it impacts our patient population. What happens when uh, patients who are attributed to us go to a different organization uh, for, our, um, for a tertiary level of care uh, or whatnot? How that works? Uh, you know, what costs are in? Uh, uh, what's the cost of care at those particular places, uh, et cetera, and how that impacts us? So it's a very uh, complex, uh, difficult uh, system to understand, um, and that's. I just want to be clear. I'm not. Um, I'm not criticizing anybody. One care is under the same time pressure as we are. They have to get information in a very compressed time frame as well. They have to put together a budget that they bring before you and, and bring before their board um, uh, that they need to be able to make very difficult decisions on as well. But for us, we haven't had all that information that we need to make these decisions or for me even to answer that question that you've asked. Great, well I appreciate that, thank you. That explains a lot. Um, just a couple of more questions. Uh, this is actually a small and minor point, but uh, you know, as we think about integration of healthcare, it, you know, that's going to be a key element of our healthcare reform. And one important step is to get more patients on the BHI. We've been hearing a lot about the number of patients on the BHI, and therefore we have to get to a critical mass so that mass so that providers will go into the BHI to get patient data and better sense of all of the care that patients have been receiving. So one of the things I've learned recently is that hospitals can actually play a pretty critical role in implementing electronic consent through their ABT uh, interface and their EHR. I know you have a new EHR, and I'm wondering, do you have the capacity in your budget this year to be able to commit IT resources, which I understand are about 48 hours, to uh, help ensure that we have more patient data on the VHAC? <laughs> Just a question. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, um, you know, I I've, would have to take a look at, you know, um, obviously going back and stuff. I know that the ADT information with CPSI wasn't a simple, um, easy solution. It actually was going to uh, involve um, individuals, um, bodies doing that. And I don't know what the capabilities um, of uh, um, ECW is at this time to be able to answer that question. Okay, that's fine. We can get back to that. The, the last question related to EMR is, you had mentioned you have a new EMR that allows you to understand where there might be over-ordering of tests, I think is what you had said, um, and assessing outliers in what I would just call over-utilization. And I'm wondering, with our, we have a new legislative mandate, this is actually a selfish question in part, but I, I'm really curious about your answer, to measure over-utilization through our newly imagined HRAP. So I'm actually wondering, since you did say something to the effect of your new HR will allow you to figure out where there may be overordering of tests, how do you measure overutilization within your hospital? What are the specific metrics by which you can say this is overutilization? So um, again, we implemented that in April, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, I'm uh, patient. You ask for patients, I give patients. But I'm sure, I am curious about yeah. how do we figure out where there's overutilization? Um, I think you have to just compare. Um, uh, you have to do comparison. You know, for us, uh, you know, we have, we will only have access to information within our own um, uh, within our own entity. So comparing within, uh, comparing amongst our own uh, people is uh, you know the, the simplest way of doing that. Um, 
you know, we will, um, uh, I assume, once we are, at whatever point we are participating, participating with uh, the One Care and the All Hair model, that there will be additional information and resources that they'll be able to bring to bear uh, in regard to that as well. So um, uh, I think those are the ways we would, they would be able to compare to a wider, um, a wider peer group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jess. So uh, being leery of the clock, I'm going to uh, not ask you my questions, and uh, I may be following up and writing to you again. I um, do want to make a couple of comments. One is that uh, uh, last year when you came in, you were a new CEO, and clearly you have settled into that. I think if I had CMS back at the uh, shop and I was sitting here, there would be sweat pouring out my cheeks. Um, the other comment I'd like to make is that wouldn't it be a wonderful world if we could come in and somebody would say, rather than it's a down year, say we had an absolutely great year. Um, our primary care providers did such a good job managing the population that our total costs were, our revenues were down significantly and we've uh, made adjustments to our expenses accordingly. And I hope that somehow in Vermont we can get to that place where we're creating a healthier population and. Uh, we don't look at revenue as being the indicator of a good or bad year. Um, Pat, before I turn it over to the healthcare advocate, <coughs> are there any questions that you or your team have? Uh, we'll defer um, given the time. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate that. So I'll turn it over to Julia and Eric. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Can people hear me in the back? Yes, okay. Uh, my name is Julia Shaw. I'm with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, so our office advocates for consumers, um, both in healthcare policy and proceedings like this, and also for individual Vermonters um, who have problems accessing the healthcare that they need. Um, so I wanted to thank you for your presentation and also um, for your answers to our written questions that you provided before the hearing. Um, so I'm wondering, um, so our office here is regularly from Vermonters who have trouble affording the health care that they need. Um, I'm wondering if you would agree that, that affordability is a problem for Vermonters in accessing health care. Um, obviously, um, uh, that is um, uh, a challenge. Um, uh, thank you for uh, giving us a, a preview of your questions as well, give us, as, as well give us a chance to um, uh, consider those. Um, so we do um, we do see that as uh, an issue. We have seen that as uh, uh, an issue. There's really been a, a switch over the years from people who had no health insurance, uh, and uh, when people have no health insurance, obviously uh, when they do need care, um, it becomes very difficult to pay for it. It's been more of a switch to more people who are covered with some sort of health insurance with uh, expansion over the years and the Affordable Care Act. However, there are, are more uh, high deductible plans uh, in, in play now, which um, that people have coverage, but they pay the first dollars up to a, in some cases, a very large amount. So uh, those challenges extend to those, um, uh, to those plans as well. At Gifford, um, as we noted, we are a federally qualified health center in addition to being a critical access hospital. We do offer um, care to people regardless of their ability to pay. Um, and we do uh, work with um, with, it, with uh, our community members uh, to uh, try to uh, what we assess whether they qualify for uh, uh, reduced or no fee uh, care based on their income. Um, uh, and one of your questions was, does this affect people's uh, ability, the cost affect their ability to access care? And, uh, you know, what we can't um, uh, ascertain is uh, when people choose not to. Um, seek care or delay seeking care because of the affordability, but obviously um, that exists. Thank you. Um, and um, so I'm wondering if, you're, if you've heard from your providers um, of instances where people are not accessing care because they're unable to afford it. Maybe they're over income for um, their financial assistance policy, but they still can't pay for the care. Um, I think well, I, I talked earlier about our um, post-acute discharge clinic, which again, somebody is an inpatient, somebody is an in the emergency department or has frequent emergency department visits. Um, we um, uh, try to get them into a, a post-acute um, 
visit within 48 to 72 hours. One of the things that um, we try to do there, again, is ensure that they are able to follow up with care. Because in some instances, they might be in that setting because they didn't seek care in a primary care setting or in a less uh, expensive setting. So we try to work with them to figure out what resources they have, um, you know, what resources are available, um, try to uh, work with people so that they can access uh, some of the prescription assistance programs uh, so that they can afford their drugs um, when, they, when they have prescriptions. Uh, again, so they can avoid those higher levels of um, uh, the higher cost uh, levels of care and also get them aligned with uh, primary care and some of the other resources that are available to them. Um, I don't have specific instances um, uh, to share with you, but I think that is, um, you know, that is something that um, the providers will hear from time to time. People won't fill their prescriptions or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we try to put every resource in place that we can to uh, make sure that's not some of the reality. Um, so some hospitals in the past have qualified that debt as um, money that people are unwilling to pay versus free care as money that people are unable to pay. I'm wondering if you agree with that characterization, um, that all bad debt is due to unwillingness of patients to pay their Well, I think there's, a, there's an accounting handling of that and uh, um, I assume what you're, you're getting to is uh, you know, more of a philosophical, um, uh, but uh, you know, there's an account of, uh, in, in doing our accounting, having our audit, we have to handle it in a particular way. Um, and that is where bad debt, um, how different types of accounts um, uh, are the, the, the monies that consider bad debt. Um, but no, I can't sit here and, and, and tell you that everyone that's Everything that's classified as bad debt is because someone refuses to pay. And obviously, in some cases, people uh, don't have the, the funds to, to pay for it. I mean, I, the other um, thing that I would like to say is um, affordable care is a process-driven <coughs> process, i.e. the patient comes in, fills out the application, you know, supplies us all the information. Um, you know, so they're engaging us to um, say that this is care that the, um, they can't pay for. Mm -hmm. That debt on the other side is not that um, type of uh, service. Okay. Um, I'm wondering how you assess for lenders' ability to pay when setting your prices for services and also setting eligibility for those types of assistance. So unfortunately, um, you know, our item master is over um, 7,000 lines of data. Um, you know, when we set the pricing, um, we don't have a study in there that says that these, um, you know, are for this type of patient versus that type of patient. It's for the most part across the board when we set our prices. So but I, I mean more in terms of, so if you're looking at a certain service and setting the price for that service, whether it's, you know, assuming it's for all patients, um, do you take into co consideration um, the affordability to people of that service when you're setting that price? So we compare to yeah, I, I would say at this, you know, we don't have that ability to get down to that level to you know, understand how to answer that question. Thank you. Um, so, um, when you get your commercial rate approved um, by the board, whether it's the amount you requested or another amount, do you consider that to be a set rate or, or a ceiling? A set rate. A set rate. So at that point, you wouldn't then negotiate with the insurer and then end up at a lower place. It would, that would be the rate that would be implemented. That would be October 1st. Uh, we would implement that rate. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just have one more question. Um, so you mentioned the uh, new Narcan distribution program. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. So we have a site that's uh, up, it's located in a place we call Kingwood. It's right off the interstate, off the 89. Um, and we provide um, we provide addiction medicine services in that clinic a certain number of days a week. So um, what we've agreed to do is work with the state. They're supplying us with some uh, a, a number of Narcan packets. Um, and anybody can come in off the street, ask for it, and it's handed to them with no questions. Um, so the directions are in it. Uh, they're there to answer questions. And as long as we're open um, and there's people in the site, we're able to hand it out until we're until they're gone. 
Um, there's a little bit of a tracking mechanism, but not anything that's requesting your name or um, any information about you or why you're asking for it. Um, and does that say offer, or other sites, you know, can we offer other harm reduction services like syringe exchange or, um, you know, healthcare services So, um, Ashley did uh, noted that um, we did implement a uh, drug disposal unit uh, in our uh, at our hospital um, this past year. Um, we also um, the question is sent out before we do offer wound care services. Um, we have had a concerted effort uh, on HPV uh, immunization and uh, have done a good job uh, with that as well. Um, we do have a full service substance use addiction medicine uh, program. One of the um, key characteristics, I think, for the Narcan distribution is that that is occurring at a uh, clinic that can provide uh, treatment uh, and services for people as well. So um, they are coming in the door. We're not asking them to engage in services, um, but um, they are there and they have access to people if they uh, choose to. So that is a um, what we think is a uh, potential benefit to being able to provide uh, access to, to services for people who maybe say, well, maybe it's time. So, um, so yes, there are, there are services. Thank you. Okay, that's all our questions. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we're going to open it up to the public for any public comments or questions. Uh, please stand up and state your name and address your question <coughs> through your list. Go ahead, Dale. Dale Hackett from Barry, Vermont. Um, just a question as a consumer. When I was looking at your information, there's something that has been bothering me and maybe can help me figure this out. And that is I keep looking at the quality measures and I keep reading articles and data from other places as well. And it's not aligning with how well the measures say they are doing. The more I look at it, especially when I look at and trying to compare what is my workforce. I see the workforce shortages. And when I start looking for how long does it take to see the patient, I'm getting feedback of experiences of one, two, three weeks, unless they're seeing just anybody. And then when I look for the quality of the experience and the care delivered, I don't see that aligning with the measures as well. So it's got me wondering about the measures and the risk assessment. I think the risk is higher than is being talked about. I think there's a great deal of risk in not having enough workforce. And that's what I'm getting at, is I'm seeing things in reality that don't play out the way the measures show them to be. And I'm not sure, did we build in an illusion? Is it catching up to us? I don't quite know where this all goes, but I don't see it aligning. It, it's falling apart. Thank you, Dale. And, uh, Dan, I thought that uh, actually Gifford did a very good job of uh, answering the questions as it related to uh, access time and uh, workforce. Um, uh, I think each of us on the board hear the same things that Dale are hearing. Um, but from your submission, it really didn't uh, uh, appear to be a significant problem at Gifford. So is, is Dale accurate in his <coughs> assessment for your particular hospital service area? or? Um, do you have a different story? No, I don't think I have a different story. I think um, one of the comments that, that Dale made, I think, is, is apt, and um, I alluded to it earlier, is um, 
historically, I think uh, all of us, when we had a primary care uh, provider, we had that pr a primary care provider for years, and we had that relationship, and um, that was um, that was the way healthcare was delivered, and I think in general it, it worked pretty well. Um, that's really not. You don't see that as much anymore. There's more turnover. Uh, people not, uh, primary care providers not staying in one place as long. There aren't as many of them. Um, you have uh, situations, Dale noted that, um, yes, you're getting in to see appointment. Maybe you're not seeing your primary care provider. You're seeing the person who's, who has openings in their schedule that day. Uh, those are changes uh, in uh, how services are provided. Um, and that is, uh, I think, something that uh, in some cases, patients are fine with that. In other cases, uh, they're not fine with that. So uh, it's striking that balance, having that flexibility, uh, being able to provide um, uh, you know, consistent, steady primary care providers for people so they can see the people they want to see, uh, but also understanding that uh, if you have a, um, an acute need, um, you, you may need to see uh, someone other than the, the person you normally do and uh, uh, making sure that people understand that and ultimately you're okay with that. So it's a, it's a continuing struggle, I think, for the whole system. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? So I guess uh, that will wrap up um, the presentation from Gifford. We thank the Gifford team. And uh, we're gonna take a five minute break and give Coffee the opportunity to uh, get set up.